Welcome to Colonized Minds, the podcast. This is Elizabeth Guzman. This is Luke Givens. So we do have a very special guest today. This is easily like one of our favorite people. This might be our favorite like person on campus. Yeah. Yeah, we can really easily say that. Easily say that. Um, if he was still working here, it would just be, you know, we wouldn't necessarily even look at him differently. But now he's moved up in the world on a bigger and better <laughs> things. Left us all behind. Yeah. Like, we thought we were in the penthouse because we were on the second floor. You know you're big time when you move to the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> the third floor of another building. <laughs> no, we have with us today uh, the new interim director for the TRIO Roots program at the Cascade Campus, Dr. General Johnson. So, Dr. Johnson, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so, as you already heard, I started here at the Multicultural Center. Uh, I was a part of uh, Luke's and Elizabeth's team. Uh, we were the first team to uh, inaugurate the Multicultural Center here at Cascade Campus at PCC, and uh, we did, and we do phenomenal work, um, powerful work. I started here as the um, first program out of the that was operating out of the Multicultural Center. I was program advisor for the African American Men's Scholars Program and then became the assistant coordinator um, of the Multicultural Center here. So I've been working with Luke directly. Um, this will be my third year, and, uh, and it's still uh, working collaboratively, um, even though I've moved to TRIO Student Support Services, um, still on Cascade Campus, but in the um, Student Services Building, third floor. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw that in. Yeah, the top floor. <laughs> So what is the, the TRIO Student Support Services? Uh, so TRIO Student Support Services um, is obviously a branch of TRIO, which started in the 60s, which are uh, comprised of three separate fer federally funded programs. Um, one is Talent Search. The other is Upward Bound. And for our particular services here, it's Student Support Services. So those three comprise the TRIO. Um, and so they... Our program in particular is geared towards students who are already in college. Talent search is for high school students wanting to go to college, and Upper Bound is for high school students that want to go to college. And some students can still maintain uh, op op opportunities to be in Upper Bound if the college actually has an undergraduate program for Upper Bound students. Gotcha. So our program is specific to um, students who are first generation um, College students. That means that they have they don't have a parent who is actually a college graduate. Uh, for those who are low income, and for students who have a documented disability. So, if I were a student um, wanting to get involved with Trio, what would mm -hmm. that process look like? So, one thing would be to you can certainly come to the office, but we have actual orientations that occur in the orientation center in SSB or the Student Services Building uh, 206 every other Tuesday of the month and from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. So you come and you get a literal introduction uh, via PowerPoint um, to uh, the TRIO, TRIO Student Support Services programming here on the Cascade campus. And then we have um, opportunities for question and answers as well. So because of the nature of the program, it's federally funded through the Department of Education and there will be documentation that will be necessary for students who want to uh, participate in the program. TRIO is a voluntary program. Um, it is a, based for student retention and completion. And um, we have about 111 students already. And we are hoping to serve 140 students by August 31st of 2017. Okay. So we have about 30 more to go. So there's documentation that is necessary. For instance, if a student is uh, low income, they have to have tax forms and things of that nature to support that, um, things of that nature. They have to go through the orientation. Um, there's a checklist to make sure they have the GPA of a 2.0 or above, and they have to have a minimum of nine credits. Is this, is this, uh, is this service open to students who... Uh, are undocumented res residents of the U.S.? Sure, because uh, many undocumented residents pay taxes. Mm. Yeah, many do. And so they just need, we just need to have the form uh, showing that those, do those necessary documents for them to actively or to be participants in the program or to be accepted into the program, so sure. 
Gotcha. I the think other thing I wanted to add too is that uh, the students, in terms of their classes, they need to be in the lower maths. Mm -hmm. So like math twenty, math sixty five, or nine. Gotcha. And um, writing 120, 121, 121. So I'm really glad you clarified um, the undocumented status because I know that we, we often have folks who assume that because programs are federally funded that you can't access them right. um, unless you are a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. Yeah, it's a lot of um, things are changing for people to have more equitable access to a lot of the programming that has been in place for years. So that's a, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Very much agree so. So we have also uh, certain classes that the students have to take. So again, I said it's a voluntary program. However, the classes are mandatory. So students will start with basic study skills or CG 111B um, for basic study skills. They have to take um, CG 105 and Writing 105, which is specific for uh, writing for scholarships. And then there's the 114 for finances. So it's just about learning about personal finances, which is something that's very, very important for college students. So they learn things that are relative to being a student, but also to everyday living and when they move on uh, to the four year and beyond. So it's basic uh, financial literacy. 101. No, I'm, I'm really glad that y'all do that because oftentimes um, as students and including myself, you go into college, you're a first generation college student or might just not have a lot of knowledge about college in itself, take out, you know, grants, scholarship loans um, and don't really know what the impact of those might be once you graduate. So right. having financial liter literacy really, really helps. Yeah. Most pe it, it helps a great deal. You, because of the nature of the program, um, we have a wide variety or wide range of age groups. So even for students who are older, who may be returning to school as an older student, uh, and certainly those who are younger students who are just uh, going into school, um, those things are important because even at both ends of that, the spectrum of that particular range, things have changed so dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the amount of money that uh, students are taking out, uh, to go to college undergrad is really, really interesting and it's really, really important that they really understand the nature of the loan and the entire process because many students, unfortunately, even at the community college level, have exhausted their finances in terms of their ability or eligibility for loans before they even get to the four-year side. Oh, yeah. Happens pretty consistently. Well, just about 30 to 40 years ago, loan, like federal aid paid for 75%. Mm -hmm. of your, your college attendance tuition, and mm -hmm. now it's down to about 25%. Isn't that something? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sad because just the, the idea that a, that a Pell Grant initially was meant to cover your tuition. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know? That was something that uh, Dr. Goldrick Robb was, yeah. uh, was talking about. She talked about it in a new book, and she, she was talking about it during her lecture. Was, was that, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the idea of the Pell Grant was that it was supposed to cover all of your tuition. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's just amazing. And that, these policies that were in place, that was in, during Ronald Reagan's presidency, mm -hmm. 1983. Mm -hmm. No new policy has been initiated uh, in that regard since 1983. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just stayed a flat rate, essentially. Yeah. Uh, really, the only thing that has changed with the Pell Grant is they've created a limit. You yeah. can only do it for, what, six six consecutive years? Mm -hmm. Or not consecutive years, but six years. You can only utilize it for six years, and yeah. then you've reached your max. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing she uh, she talked about, and I think we talked about it on here, too, was even the idea of the EFC, right? That, you know, yeah. the estimated family contribution and yeah. how that's used to determine what that um, – what that Pell is going to be, but mm -hmm. oftentimes for many of those students, they're not necessarily getting a family contribution. So she gives the, gives the example of the student who is make I think, I think her name was Chloe, you know, her, right. her total income, her, her mother's income was $28,000 a year and the EFC or estimated family contribution was supposed to be like 3000 so right. this person makes twenty eight thousand dollars a yeah. year, and you're supposed to give three thousand dollars towards education expenses. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's not going to work. Yeah, it is interesting seeing the um, the number of students that have to work. You know, right. generally, you know, you had the student that wanted to work. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's almost it's almost um, such that students have to work 
in order to uh, supplement their education. And uh, particularly if you're going to school full time and having to have a full time job, some of those students have two, some have three jobs, notwithstanding all the other responsibilities that may be a part of that person's life, their lived experience. And so um, for um, supportive uh, programming like the Pell Grant to not have had uh, any type of um, addendums since 1983 is huge because that's basically saying that we've stopped there, but we've progressed as a nation and as a people in terms of um, inflation, uh, cost of living, uh, cost of education, but our policy hasn't evolved to support our own personal evolution right. as a society. Yeah. And I yeah. think it's important that that whole story gets told because I think sometimes these things get talked about, but there's not necessarily like the facts to back those things up. And mm-hmm. so if we, what we pay attention to is the rising cost of education, mm-hmm. right? And so then that becomes the tagline. That becomes what people uh, talk about on both sides, but they're not really talking about, yeah, there's a rising cost of education mm-hmm. and there's less of an investment by our our federal and state governments in education, mm-hmm. which is leading to yeah. a rising cost in education. So, But I think when you're able to explain that and paint a much larger picture, people can make a little bit more of an informed decision, like regardless of voting, right? Just in being able to talk about these issues, they can speak in a much more informed way because they have right. more of the right. pictures as opposed to repeating the whole tagline like education costs too much it keeps mm-hmm. going up well there's a reason why it keeps going up yes and if you look at the, historically where funding has come from in education it's really actually fascinating first it wasn't um it wasn't states or like federal governments or whatever oh, yeah. it was it was actually private Church. donors yeah mm-hmm. um and in a couple of colleges were started before the U.S. was even, you know, established. Mm-hmm. Like the and it was Ivy still Leagues. part of, uh, <laughs> of, of Great Britain. Mm-hmm. And so the king, <laughs> the king was supplementing a lot of, of the costs of higher ed. Yeah. And then afterwards, it was private donors. Mm-hmm. And then, like, until recently, it wasn't until recently that the federal government really started taking um, investment into higher ed. But that quickly went away as well. Um, a lot of the investment was actually during both world wars. Here we go again, like looking at the uh, the impact of war on our society as a whole, in this particular instance in education. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And mean, so as as that, that funding has diminished from our, our state and federal government, uh, now higher ed, from what I understand, a lot of it is a mix, mix, mixture of funding, so some from federal state government, other from private donors and foundations, um, and others actually from industry and corporations that are pushing for specific research to be conducted. Mm -hmm. I just got an interesting email from a student this morning uh, wanting me to uh, provide some insight into a situation where um, they're in school full-time and they work part-time, and although they're doing well in their classes, the ratio of debt is considerably increasing in their life, and they really feel like they just want to stop. They're yeah. not doing badly in classes or anything like that, but they just, they're, it's almost like they're, um, they're disconcerted about the possibility of really being able to make a living in a right. career that's really important to them and that they're studying uh, based on the average salary and how that's going to allow them to reasonably pay their loans back. It's yeah. a very interesting conversation um, that I think is happening across the board. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And, and that, that, too, is a part of that evolution. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't always, quote, unquote, like that. <laughs> you know, not, not, not as significantly as it is now. I mean, there were always were those who were going to school for one thing and ended up working in something that maybe have been seemingly completely different or yeah. literally completely different. But now it's quite common to uh, work in a field that doesn't necessarily reflect what one's major was at all. Right. Um, and again, to explain in all of that money that was put forward to, uh, to attain that degree mm-hmm. can be like a question mark for people like, okay, I, wanted a degree in this to do that, and now I'm doing this, and now I'm paying back that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it also it, makes people have to, you have to think about, like, in the long term, I mean, what does that, what is that going to do to certain industries? 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if yeah. I may really want to do something and I might need a college education, quote unquote, to do that. Mm-hmm. But if I understand that I'm going to take out more in debt than I'm going to make in. I'll take out more in four years of debt than I will make in eight years of salary. That no longer becomes a viable option. So if we're starting to think kind of like a long term, there are plenty of professions that are going to suffer that need college degrees, but because they don't pay enough, mm-hmm. um, they're going to suffer. So one of two things has to be done. Either those industries have to begin paying more, which typically these are industries that move very slow and it's very difficult to pay more money. Like I higher never, ed? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even say just higher ed. I just think education period across the board, right? Mm-hmm. Um yeah. yeah, and there's more I can say to that, but um, either you're going to have to pay more or what it costs to get that degree is going to have to go down. Right. Think about this in a different term or a different, different way. Um, I don't have kids, uh, but there's plenty of people who are probably listening who have kids. There is someone who may, they may spend more time during a day with your child than you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That person is responsible for your child Mm -hmm. right when you are not there they are teaching your child whether you like it or not are instilling certain values in your child this person is the primary person responsible for your child's education now we can argue that the parent should actually be the person that's primary responsible for child's education but if this kid is in school for six to eight hours this person has a huge impact on this kid's education and their learning is this really the person that you don't want to pay a lot of money? Right. Right. Like I I would imagine that this is a person who should be pretty well taken care of. Yeah. Right. So even, I guess if you, if you look at it in a different way, like it just, to me, that doesn't make sense. And that's what I mean. So when we begin thinking about um, kind of like long term, right, what does this do? What does this do for education? Right. Um, Across the board, K through 12, well, K all the way up to, to higher ed. Mm-hmm. Um, what type of people are we attracting? And I know like one of the things that gets you know, said is like, uh, you know, uh, you shouldn't be doing it for the money. Yeah, you're right. I don't, I don't, <laughs> no teacher I know does it for the money. Mm-hmm. But I also think there's this thing that we do with um, certain professions, like uh, public service, like people who, who are doing well, that we act as if they shouldn't also be compensated, mm-hmm. right? right? So these people do right. good things and they don't, it's almost like we say they don't deserve to get paid mm-hmm. like uh, a decent wage mm-hmm. because they're good people. Like parents right. almost. Yeah. It's, and it's like, it's respects. your, mm-hmm. and I don't know, there's something that's like, it's almost like you're taking advantage of mm-hmm. the fact that like people who are nice and people who are generous mm-hmm. are going into these fields. Mm-hmm. So it's like you can get away with paying them less money. Mm-hmm. So you do. Right. Um, but how different would it be if as a as a teacher, you weren't having to dig into your own pocket to purchase supplies for, you know, for your students and then mm-hmm. getting that back when you file your taxes? Mm-hmm. Right. And you don't you, really get that back. Yeah, when exactly. You, file your taxes. you don't. Right. Yeah. Or if you were one of those students who like you're worried about, you know, keeping the lights on or you got to live with four and five roommates mm-hmm. um, just to be able to pay rent. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you're responsible for molding and shaping minds like to me that's just it's hard for me to rationalize that or wrap my head around that Mm -hmm. how that's somehow okay right and the thing is that 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 extends be even beyond even that those examples you look at higher ed right you can tell from an institution what it is that they value and the way that they compensate what it is that you're doing so if you're an institution who really focuses on research you compensate the professors who are doing research, not necessarily how they're teaching or if they're invested in the pedagogy of their, their teaching, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you're at an institution who values the teaching of undergraduate or graduate or PhD students a lot more than anything else, you compensate that teaching, ideally. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting how, um, how as institutions we place value on certain things mm-hmm. and how that might be reflective or lack thereof um in compensation right what's interesting i mean i I, you know we we work with students all the time right this community college and we have a lot of students who transfer it's one of the things i I talk to students with all the time like follow the money see where Mm -hmm. the money is so the one thing that um that i was told it was on one of my very first college uh tours was 
you never want to go to an institution where there's not construction. There's no money. So if you go to an institution and they, they're not building something, that means there's no money coming in. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's that. But then also look at where that money is going. Right. Is that money going to a new science building? Is that money going to a gym? Where exactly is that money going? Because if you begin to follow that money, you can see like where the priorities are for that institution. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a very good point. So, I think I'm glad you brought that up because mm-hmm. I think for, um, for students or even as staff who are looking at, uh, at other institutions to transfer to next, that's a very important comment and observation to make. Absolutely. It is. I mean, I know when I'm talking to students and it's like, hey, you know, you want to study uh, education. That's great. Go study education. Go go take a tour. See what the classroom are they still they still write on chalkboards? Right. Um, that might not be the place that you want to go, especially when they're writing in chalkboards. But you know, when you go to the computer science department or you go to you know the the physics uh, lab or you go to you know journalism and they have nice brand new stuff. Not saying they don't need it, but if you can see that the money's being spent there, but you aren't one of those majors. You may not get all that, mm-hmm. right? You're going to have a very different experience than a student who's choosing to to study something else. Right. That's very true. Um, you see the, um, the the construction is also reflective of growth. Mm-hmm. You know, you're seeing physical or literal growth taking place before your very eyes. And you also want to be able to be fully functional when you leave, you know? Yeah. So what type of equipment or material one is exposed to is going to be very, very germane to an internship. Um, are you going to be able to go in and know exactly what a laptop is? I mean, I'm just, you know, pointing some things out. It could be anything. But um, not being able to um, partake of um, opportunities because there's a lack of um, understanding or awareness that something like that actually existed. Those are the types of things that we should be being, we should as students, should, students should be exposed to uh, in their educational experience mm-hmm. because they're not, what, 90% of the learning takes place outside of the walls of the classroom anyway. So how do we prepare our students within that, the time frame that they're in within those walls to be able to be functional when they get out? So to not look at that or... Uh, I think when I was in high school, um, some of the things that were commonly uh, spoken of were, and and maybe not necessarily with me as general, but like that I would hear people talking about. It was they would want to go. They would want to go to a school that had the best football or basketball team. Oh, yeah. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, do you me. play football or basketball? I mean, <laughs> you know, seriously, it's like whoa. And um, and interestingly, some of those schools had some of the highest or most competitive criteria to even get in, yeah. <laughs> right? And so, um, just kind of balancing that. And thinking for myself was, I wanted to go someplace that would prepare me to do what it is that I felt or believed that I wanted to do. That was like the most important thing mm-hmm. for me. All right. Well, it looks like we <laughs> are running out of time. I personally want to thank you for joining us on the podcast again, Dr. Sure. Dr. Johnson. Thank you. I'm glad you stopped by every once in a while whenever you get a chance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't let you get home. too far. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have any announcements for today? We just had a uh, trio orientation. Um, so the next one will be the week after next. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Second, fourth Tuesday of the month. And mm-hmm. what time did you say? At 1 o'clock from 1 to 2, SSB 206, the orientation center. Great. I think that's all of our announcements. And so you've been listening to Colonized Minds of the podcast. This is Elizabeth Guzman Arroyo. And this is Luke Givens. Saying, so what if it's true? <laughs>